For over a hundred years, the American Psychiatric Association has served the community to work for better mental health for all. In the age of social media and artificial intelligence, new technology presents new challenges. But to learn how to tackle this and more, we're here at the 2023 annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association, and this is APA TV. It's our third show here in the Golden Gate City, and so far we've looked at the impact psychiatry has had on society and society on it, as well as new insights into the impact the body has had on the mind. Today we're looking at technology, both the impact of smart devices and digital interventions on treatment itself, and the wider impact technology is having on our mental health. On the show today, we check out a social media session featuring TikTok doctor Jake Goodman. And stand by for a look at how artificial intelligence can be used to identify suicide risk. Plus, on the APA TV film series today, we look at a range of companies and hospitals bringing new technology to the field of psychiatry. And remember, you can watch APA TV on screens at the Moscone, in select hotels, on the APA website, via the app, and of course on the virtual platform. And you can find, share, subscribe and like on social media. Coming up, we sit down with Rebecca Brendel to see how her presidential year has gone. But first, over to Eric Williams to find out what's happening today at the APA annual meeting. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Williams, Chair of the Scientific Program Committee. Welcome to day four. An important highlight of today is our Changing the Conversation plenary at 1030 in Exhibit Hall F. APA CEO and Medical Director, Dr. Saul Levin, will host philanthropist David Huntsman, Christina Huntsman, and CEO of the Huntsman Mental Health Institute, Dr. Mark Rappaport, alongside APA Foundation's Board of Trustees member, Dr. Monica taylor Desir. Together, they'll discuss how you can get involved in exciting new efforts to tell the world what we know well, there's no health without mental health. Today is the last day to visit the exhibit hall, so make sure you drop by for networking, coffee, snacks, and more. Have a wonderful day. Well, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be back. So, year as president almost at an end. How's it been? It's been a spectacular year. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve this organization, to interact with the members, and to represent psychiatry around the world. Give us an idea of some of the highlights. Well, there have been a couple of areas of highlight. One has really been about advocacy, the ability to spend time changing the law and the structure of how we can get mental health care to every American who needs it. Uh, there's been some amazing progress that we made at APA on the future of psychiatry. And then there's also been the opportunity to collaborate with colleagues around the world as we come out of COVID and we begin to reconnect. One of the things that we've really gained traction with is reaching out to communities who have been historically excluded. And so one major initiative was launching our Spanish English bilingual website, lasaludmental.org, uh, to provide high quality information that's culturally informed to the Hispanic community in the U.S. So as you've been around the world, uh, you know, connecting with colleagues, as you say, well, what are some of the issues do you think that, uh, that we all share? Well, the one core issue that we all share is that there, there aren't enough of us. Uh, and so we're all going to have to work together to think about creative solutions uh, to make sure that globally, everyone who needs access to high quality mental health care is able to access it. So you, you often talk about uh, a road to mental health. Where do you think we are on that road? Well, I think we're getting started. We have some of the pieces in play and we've had some, some important gains with our advocacy this year. But what we're really going to need to do over the next decade is collect data, leverage it, uh, and be at the leading edge as a highly trained, but very, very small part, uh, single digits of the mental health workforce. So you've just been to the Emerging Voices plenary session, which I know is very exciting, wasn't it? Tell us a little bit about that. So our speaker was Heather McGee, who's a lawyer and an economic uh, a policy leader, who really talks about some of the tragic things that have happened to all of us as a result of racism 
and yet fundamentally remains hopeful that we can make better decisions for the future. So what, what made you, you know, you came out of that session with quite a bounce to your step. So what, what, what made you excited about that session? Well, we had a panel discussion following her talk uh, that brought together the president of the American Medical Association and the American Bar Association and really just how we as professionals with deep ethical and professional commitments to advancing health, advancing justice and to equity can all work together. Well, thanks very much indeed for taking time to talk to us. I'm sure it was a great year, so thank you. Thank you so much. First up in our technology-focused field trip, let's take a look at Healthy Gamer, a mental health platform that meets young people where they live, and that's online. Healthy Gamer is a digital mental health platform that's designed to help especially young people with the problems of the digital age. We do everything from psychoeducation on our Twitch and YouTube channels, as well as community-run events that help people learn some of the skills that kids in the digital age have difficulty developing. And we also have a peer support program that helps people with things like forming social connections, finding direction in life. We think it's really important to meet people where they're at, in their language, in their online spaces, where they're talking about their anxiety or their isolation or their loneliness on places like Discord and Twitch. That's where we want to be. We want to spread psychoeducation about different mental health conditions to 10,000, a million people in one shot. There is a huge movement for better mental health, for breaking down social barriers, and I think it's creating a huge cultural shift, and it's been beautiful. Over to another company now doing game-changing work in the field. Mobio Interactive offers precision digital tools to psychiatric services around the world. There's so much information in neuroscience that has yet to be translated into how we deliver psychiatry. What's exceptional about Mobile Interactive is how we use computer vision and AI to extract biomarkers from the human face to objectively quantify brain states. The potential of the Mobile Interactive platform is that people can sort of do something that will help their mental well-being while also feedback information to clinicians. It would really help us clinicians uh, understand how that person is doing without having to subjectively ask them every like week or every two days. We are using OMDTX as a psychotherapy um, preparation tool. So patients who are roughly a month away from entering into a program are given access. We're moving to personalized health, integrating technology to bridge to the last mile of care, which is one of the hardest challenges that exists in uh, private health and uh, public health. Ultimately, we want to be able to have precision psychiatry available to any patient anywhere in the world that needs it. That's the promise of Mobile Interactive, precision psychiatry at scale. Let's head over to an exciting session on the more positive side to social media. We caught up with TikTok Doctor to hear how we can use it to educate, advocate and empower. When I first started, my OG followers consisted of my parents, a few friends, and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. But as the months progressed, the account grew and my mission expanded. I posted about the rates of depression and suicide ideation in medical students. I posted about the inequality that exists regarding the prohibitive cost of medical education. My name is Jake Goodman. I'm a second year psychiatry resident doctor and a mental health activist. I started on social media in January of 2020 with no social media experience. And today I have a channel that has 2.1 million followers and I've reached over a half billion people across the world using videos educating about mental health topics. In short, I create engaging videos teaching people about mental health and um, letting people know that reaching out is a strength, not a, not a weakness. I use social media as a tool to reach the masses. For example, I worked with the White House in uh, 2022 as part of a round table of other physicians who are, have social media platforms about how to spread updates from the White House about mental health or physical health. And one of those updates was the new 988 crisis line. So I created a video about 988 and uh, was 
posted it on all platforms and had over 150,000 people see that video. And now they know about 988 because of a video they saw on social media. That's one of the, my favorite parts about social media, educating the masses about something that's extremely important, like crisis prevention lines. When I first started, there wasn't a lot of people talking about mental health on TikTok. There were a few, but there was a void. And I sort of stepped into that role. I wanted to also document my journey in medicine in hopes of inspiring other people, but mainly create content around mental health. And over the years, I've been able to work with people like the people I worked with today, who uh, in the social media panel, who have built platforms of their own. We've collaborated in different ways, and I've been able to reach and touch people that I would never normally be able to reach as a, as a psychiatrist seeing patients one-on-one. -on -one. 500 million people plus have seen these videos in some shape or form. And that's been a total blessing because it would take me a hundred lifetimes, a thousand lifetimes to reach that many people. There are people that their sole purpose is to make social media bad. They are gonna be posting misinformation. And as psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, we have an incredible opportunity to step into this arena and say, we are the mental health experts. We are the professionals. And this is what depression actually looks like. This is how the treatment for anxiety. This is what's going on right now in mental health. So that's an opportunity that we all have. And I would encourage anybody that's interested in social media to step into that role and start advocating for the masses. Using state-of-the-art science to treat patients, let's go to Boston Precision Therapeutics. They're using targeted accelerated transcranial magnetic stimulation to treat depression and OCD. The idea of starting Boston Precision Neurotherapeutics was born out of an interest in providing accelerated treatments to very severely depressed patients. BPN offers a combined clinical and research experience of multiple experts in this field of treatment-resistant mental health disorders. fMRI-targeted accelerated transcranial magnetic stimulation utilizes fMRI, which looks at individualized brain functioning and networks, and allows us to precisely target the transcranial magnetic stimulation to each patient. We're uh, condensing the treatment into a much shorter period of time. Uh, traditional TMS is uh, once a day, five days a week, over the course of weeks. With what we do, we do 10 treatments per day over the course of five days. And often patients see very rapid results. More innovation now as we head down under to neuropsychiatry at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Amongst many other projects, they're looking for biomarkers to distinguish between psychological and neurological disorders. Neuropsychiatry at the Royal Melbourne Hospital largely sees people who fall through service gaps. Too neurological for psychiatrists or too psychiatric for neurologists and require highly specialised tests in order to make those diagnoses. We run a multidisciplinary um, young onset dementia clinic, help them try and be as independent and live their best quality of life as they can. We've been running a DBS program uh, since 2010 for obsessive compulsive disorder. It's great to have a preview of the future where for a range of neurodegenerative conditions, we will have disease modifying treatments. The markers in neuropsychiatric disorders study or the MIND study has been running at Neuropsychiatry Royal Melbourne Hospital the aim of the study is to distinguish between psychiatric disorders and neurodegenerative or neurological disorders. My vision is that we can diagnose people within months, not years. That can only happen in a highly specialised service with the help of our uh, colleagues across all the other areas of medicine. Coming up, our interview looking at the incredible uses AI can have in identifying at-risk patients. But first, the Harquell Centre for Neuromodulation, offering a complete range of neuromodulation strategies. 
Here at the Hartwell Center for Neuromodulation, we are looking at promoting a care pathway for people with difficult to treat uh, psychiatric neurological disorders. The care pathway spans a number of options from more non-invasive to surgically invasive options. Um, these can include TMS or magnetic stimulation of the brain. We have electroconvulsive therapy, we have uh, ketamine treatments, then we have deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound. For us, what uh, really drives us is uh, really the relentless pursuit to, to develop safe and effective treatments for our patients. These are some of the most disabling diseases that there are. These are incredibly challenging, they're debilitating. So I think it's critical and it's incumbent upon us to not only try to deliver the best evidence-informed care for these patients, but to develop the next generation of therapeutics. And that's something that is essential to our mission. Well, first of all, thank you both very much indeed for coming to talk to us. We really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for inviting us, yes. So how, how important do you think artificial intelligence can be as a tool in psychiatry? I think that is the beginning of a new era of technology that we need to be aware of and also to be more involved in, in psychiatry specifically to understand the voice of the patient outside of the setting of our offices, outside of the setting of the, medic, of the medical records or the claims or the system, the healthcare system. This is something that we can help us to provide more, better care for the patients, understanding what is the mindset of them outside of the clinical setting. Tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done. Yes, yeah, so we have done work trying to understand the journey of the patient when they start having suicidal thoughts uh, and what are the differences between, you know, children and adults. We have done some work with the journey of the patient when they have depression and what are the differences between like Hispanics, African-Americans and white. What are some of the barriers to care and what are some of the opportunities for improving our treatment. And how have you actually conducted the study? What, what sort of data have you been looking at? We partnered with a company called Culture Intel. That is a company that is specialized in that, in, in analyze, uh, not for mental health uh, purposes. They analyze data, uh, open source conversation for other purposes to see what is the opinion of people for a product or things to different settings, not in psychiatry. So what we saw, it was the opportunity to use the same set or, 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 or the same data that they are using for other purposes, more for in, in the sense of, of understand the patient. So we partner, we have we established a partnership with this culture intel company that is based in, in, in uh, New York City. And we estab established a connection with them very close. We work very close with the engineers that they have the data and we guide them about what we really need from them. What did you find out from looking at the open data that you didn't already know from the close relationships you have within the communities? So one of the most interesting things for me, I work with adolescents, it was that I thought most of the adolescents will go online to social media first to look for information, right? So I thought when they were going to look about depression, anxiety, suicide, they will go to the regular social media channels. And what we found is like they were more going to the message boards of the um, some of the organizations that actually talk about this, right? So Medscape, uh, Epilepsy Foundation, right? And they tried to connect with other people who had the same illness. So we saw this as such as a big opportunity for psychoeducation to use some of these poster boards as a tool to engage these patients on learning more about their illness and to direct them to get the treatment that they need. Why do you think it's important that psychiatrists are involved here? I think that one of the important points that we have discussed is that we are the subject matter experts in psychiatry. We know exactly the criteria, the criteria that we use to for the diagnosis in the DSM-5. We know the treatments, we know. So, so if we don't get involved in this earlier, in this stage, they are starting 
but it is going to be more and more and more uh, studies and projects related with artificial intelligence. If we don't get the information or we are not involved in early stage and we are not really involved with the people that they are doing uh, the studies, we are missing a big, big piece and is the application to our patients. How would you can apply this to clinical uh, the settings? What's the next step with your work? I think that what we, there are many, many questions that they need answers. And we uh, see this like a, a, a channel, a bridge between the new technology with the un, unanswered questions that we have in psychiatry. Many, many possibilities. We are, uh, we are focusing the population that we treat uh, Dr. Falcone, the children, adolescents, I am more in the uh, Hispanic community developing programs, but together I think that we have programs um, focused in the use, more use of this technology to answer other questions that we have in, in psychiatry. Yes, and I think it can inform some of the uh, studies that we do, it can inform uh, it can help us understand the barriers that the patients are facing. It can help us look where are the patients going for information so we can create a specific tools in those settings to educate them. I think there's so many opportunities that uh, psychiatry can get out of learning what are the things that the patients are not saying in our offices. Well, thank you both ever so much indeed for talking to us. It's really, really interesting, so thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. As the world gets to grips with artificial intelligence, let's hope for more positive stories just like this one. Now that's a wrap for our third and penultimate episode of APA TV. We're not quite exhausted the world of technology and mental health, but very close. Tomorrow we look at addiction across many areas from social media to food. Make sure to watch then and remember you can watch APA TV on screens at the Moscone, in select hotels, on the APA website, via the app and of course on the virtual platform. And you can find, share, subscribe and like on social media. Make sure to follow those directions and be right back here tomorrow and we'll see you then.